right, so Dwayne, I know you're here for the podcast session. Richard, I know you're here for the podcast session. I absolutely session. am. That's right. Richard Campbell from Dot Net Rocks over here. I'll know if anybody else is here for the podcast session or not. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. All right. Then we got one person back there. All right. So, so my name is Kevin Harvell, and I'm here joined by uh, Gus Emery. Yeah, I'm Gus Emery. Nice to meet you guys. And we're going to talk a little bit about how to get involved with the rapidly growing world of podcasting. Podcasting is really getting more and more popular. Um, as you can see, this is a room loaded with various tables for different podcasters to come in and record their own shows that are here for the conference. Um, so you can find me on Twitter at Kevin Harvell. You can find Gus at... Ed underscore F underscore E. So quick disclaimers, this presentation is based on services and equipment that I personally have either used in setting up podcasts or recording and producing. Uh, up to this point, there's a lot of information available on the internet for podcasting and related to that. So, I mean, I'm just doing, going to be talking about things that I've personally used. Uh, I know Richard, for example, could probably speak for hours on experiences they've been going through. Yeah, and not only that, all three of us kind of have the same different, different opinion on microphones that we use and cameras hard. and a few other things. So, um, there, there's no right answer. The only great answer is to have good sound quality for your listeners. End of story. And good content. Good content. But the sound quality is massively important. Uh, just a quick little info about me. I'm from, from St. Louis, married, four kids. Growing up, I was not a person that I would have ever expected to be talking in front of a group of people about a topic such as talking, podcasting. Uh, so here I am giving a presentation. Uh, you know, I worked at Chrysler for 14 years, so this is not the industry that I started into, but transitioned into that over time as well. Uh, founder of STL Tech Talk LLC. Uh, first website was stltechtalk.com, and I've been co-hosting, producing podcasts since September of 2013. So a year and a half in, and I've been doing involved in over 140 episodes across the four shows as well, and our shows have been heard in nearly 100 countries around the world based on our statistics that we've seen. Uh, some of our shows are the Tech Informist, consumer-based technology, smartphones, tablets, applications, stuff like that. CodeCast, I'll let Gus yep. talk Co about that. CodeCast is a, a cast for developers. Uh, slightly different than .NET Rocks, whereas we use video uh, and can actually demonstrate code instead of just hypothetically talking about it. I think there's, a, there's room for both of us in the world and, and a few others, because everyone likes different content. Let you go with the STL Tech Talk. Yeah, if, if you dig into the CodeCast archives, you'll find an interview with Mr. Richard Campbell. I'm there. there. Actually, about podcasting as well. Um, STL Tech Talk. Yeah. <laughs> STL Tech Talk was the first podcast launched, and as you can imagine, now it's focused on St. Louis technology, things going on in the St. Louis area. And the MS Mobile Show is our newest show. It's more related for Microsoft and Windows services, devices, etc., like that. Um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with windowscentral.com. It's one of the biggest uh, Windows phone websites out there on the internet today. And we had Daniel Rubino and Richard Devine, both the editor-in-chief and executive editor of that website this week, actually. What is a podcast? A uh, podcast, essentially the recording definition is a digital audio file made available for the internet for downloading to a computer or smartphone, iPods, etc. You can listen in your car, you can listen while you're going on a run, bike ride, or just sitting at your computer desk while you're at work. You're supposed to be doing work, but it's okay. Brief history. Uh, I like to compare them to audiobooks in a way, or like radio shows, due to them being released in a serialized episode of the format. First known as audio blogging. And in February, 2004, the term podcasting, which is combined from iPod and broadcast, was first mentioned in the Guardian newspaper by Ben Hammersley. And one other thing that didn't translate into the slide was, I believe it was August 2002, was the first episode of .NET Rocks. And what? So. And, and what episode are you on? 1,150. All right. So. Just, podcast, a, just a couple. Yeah. yeah almost got to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so podcasting, that's, that's 13 years. That's, that's a long, long time. So. 
Yeah, and I'm not sure, did you guys see a, a rise around 2004 with the iPod Absolutely. and everything, just starting the steady climb at that point? And iTunes. Yeah, and iTunes. The big, the big when, when Curry and Weiner, the I mean, RSS2, which the closure, that's what made podcasting real. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, all of a sudden, but it was still, the apps were crappy. I mean, Carl wrote a lot of code back then to try and make stuff yeah. work. The, but the huge hit was when iTunes picked up podcast. That's when the numbers went through. Well, that's, that, which makes sense because it made audio easy yeah. to listen to everywhere. Right? So you, you just get to it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, even today, if you're not using an iPod it is, or an iPhone, it's still pretty hard to get a podcast. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not true. Sure. Yeah, you've got to go out generally and hunt for a podcast app on Android that's not built in natively. Windows Phone now has its own native podcasting app, which is actually pretty good compared to what they've had in the past. But that was uh, June 2005 when Apple released iTunes 4.9 with native support for podcasts, which is why you know, we just mentioned that that saw a spike in podcasting. Uh, January 2006, uh, Steve Jobs, the ex-Apple CEO, demonstrated how to create a podcast using GarageBand at Macworld Conference and Expo, uh, using new podcast studio features. And it's, you know, it's really difficult to say how many podcasts there are actually out there uh, one number I saw on Wikipedia, which we all know Wikipedia is not always anywhere near accurate, was like over 115,000. But you know there's more than that. There has to be more than that. Yeah, I, I have not been able to keep track. It's just, yeah. it's, it's just impossible. Well, and whether or not they're alive is another question entirely. Right. I mean, yeah. Okay. You'll, you'll see a podcast and you're like, gosh, they haven't recorded an episode in two years. Yeah. It's like, man, that was really a great subject too. Yeah, or they, or they record a uh, episode every year, once a year, which we've seen too. Yes. So there's nothing, no, nothing wrong with either one of them because people have time, but continuous content seems to get the best, the best download rate. So here, who here does their own podcast? Richard, you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> anybody do their own? What's that? Does anybody do their own podcast currently? Has anybody thought about starting a podcast? <laughs> there we go. Look at that. Yeah, I like to see the hands. <coughs> well, the first thing you need to decide is what your show is going to be about. Obviously, if we're software developers here, well, not myself, no, probably one of the true. only non-software developer here, um, you have to, you know, you would probably want to talk about whether your specialty is Ruby on Rails or .NET or you know, Java, C Sharp, any particular. Uh, software language you guys prefer, that might be something you want to start a show about and just talk about. Mm -hmm. Then you need to decide how often you're going to record and release new episodes. Uh, with Tech Informus, we push out uh, three episodes per week. Every other show is once a week. Uh, I know Dot Net Rocks, you guys do multiple episodes per week as three. well. Okay. Yeah, and you pre record. Um, some don't. Yeah, so, we, we have to for the velocity. Well, yeah, you do. Us. I mean, some people, uh, John Lee Dumas, he runs one called Entrepreneur on Fire. He records seven episodes on Sunday and then releases them. I mean, his shows run seven days a week. So he is every single day. And But, I mean, he's making a lot of money doing what he does with all his backing and income. And, and, and not to interrupt, but uh, with Codecast, we actually record and stream live. You can still get the, the video on iTunes or you can, or the audio as well, but we actually record and stream live. So uh, when we when we actually set up the recording, you can watch it as it happens and ask questions, which is kind of cool. And then you need to decide if it's just going to be something, a hobby, something you're going to spend 30 minutes, an hour on each week or every other week, whatever you're gonna, however often you're going to record uh, to... You know, what you want to do. I mean, you can you can make money at it. You can do it full time, or it can just be something you like to do in your spare time, which many people do. Um, will you have a co-host, or will you fly solo? Um, I like having a co-host because it gives you somebody else to talk with instead of just your voice. But a lot of that depends on the subject matter that you're wanting to talk about as well. Will you be doing an audio-only version, or will you be doing video also? As Gus mentioned, uh, Codecast makes a lot of sense to do video and audio because with with Codecast, you can, we can do screen sharing using Google Plus Hangouts. 
So when we have software developers on, they can share their screen and actually show the code and whatever it is that they're talking about and demonstrating. Uh, Mark Miller, for example, okay. he's like one of the best examples. He had his screen being shared, but then he had a some but other. He wrote, he wrote a uh, uh, webcam screen or viewer, placed it on the screen, made it hover over anything he did, and what he was demonstrating is he built a developer's keyboard. I mean, he's been on .NET Rocks and our show, but for our show, he built this little widget. And it sat on the desktop and he could zoom in on the keyboard. So he had a webcam here and they had a webcam here. But the webcam sat on his desktop so every time he pushed a button you could actually see him push the button and see the reaction on the screen at the same time. Yeah, it was, it was really, really neat. I actually need to get back to them and find out how he did that. So yeah. we can have other people do that as well. Yeah, well, that, that and see, uh, check in on him because he's just fun to talk to. Yes. Uh, will you be doing guest interviews? And if so, how often? Uh, with Tech Informus, when we launched that show in September, we wanted to do guests every single episode, but then in January, we kind of thought, once we moved to three episodes a week, we're like, I don't want to, I mean, it's a lot of work scheduling guests and making sure that they're going to be on time, so we like to start at a certain time to kind of promote when we're going to actually record, so it can kind of take a little bit of stress, but if you're just doing an episode every other week, that's, that's fine, and I found the easiest way to get guests, just reach out to them on Twitter. Pretty much everybody except like one person has been receptive in the nearly two, two years that I've been doing this. Yeah. And pretty much everybody I've went out, you know, Scott Hanselman. Uh, uh, Scott Hunter. Yes. Um, Richard. Yeah, Richard, I mean, we, I don't go, I don't always go for, you know, just normal developers. We'll go for some pretty big names and respected people. And they pretty much all say yeah. So it's been a blast talking to all these people over the over time. Oh, Matt Christensen as well. Yes, which he's actually here. Somewhere here. Thank you, Dwayne, for choosing us over at Matt's. Uh, when you do interviews, will they be in person or over the internet? Uh, there's some equipment that I'll talk about a little bit here in a moment. That with STL Tech Talk, we're transitioning that to more in-person interviews. That can do a lot more quicker and shorter episodes with them, and that'll help boost the audio quality as well. Uh, but, for example, if you're having a guest on from London, well, that's kind of expensive if you want to do an in-person interview with them. So, there's different ways that you can do that, and you know, thanks to the internet, Google Plus, with Hangouts on Air, we can talk to anybody in the world. Yeah. That's and, phenomenal. Yeah, and other ways to do that as well. Uh, do you have a slide in there for how to record? About multiple different ways, because actually, uh, what I was going to say is uh, Audacity, which is a uh, freeware uh, audio recorder, is used in a lot of podcasts where you actually record as you're speaking and <coughs> Skype at the same time, so that if the Skype stream or, or Hangout stream or whatever um, fails, you actually send your your local copy of the full recording in. The, they timestamp it with a snap or something in there. And then they can merge all of the uh, different channels together. Right. And that's that's one of the difficult ways to do it. Yeah. I mean, once you've done it a while, though, it, it just becomes pretty fluid. Um, some of the equipment you'll need, obviously, you'll need a microphone. If you're going to do it in person, you need an audio recorder, uh, whether you're using a computer or a standalone audio recorder, like a Zoom H4n, which I'll show in a, in a moment what that is. Uh, webcam, if you're doing a video podcast. Or just online interviews. Headphones. Shush. Always look to you. <laughs> he looks at me because <clears throat> we recorded one. I had forgotten my headphones and I recorded it in a glass office. <clears throat> so a lot of reverb. And, yeah, the reverb was horrendous. We tossed it. But um, yeah, uh, headphones really work and it depends on where you're recording from because I usually don't use, use them in my office at home because it's quiet enough and we don't get reverb and we don't get talk back after I get the new speakers and, and, the, and the microphone. But all of these things are independent, are in, uh, uh, dependent on each other as well. Depends on what type of microphone you get as to what kind of ambient noise you get. Um, and the, the recorder itself can blank out some of it. Mm -hmm. If you're going right in, it, it works. The headphones eliminate certain parts of it. And as he says up here, a mixer. Now, some, uh, some of us will use a mixer and some won't. I know Kevin doesn't. I do. Richard, do you use a mixer at home? 
Do you go uh, through a panel? Yeah, I use a traveler, which is a little more complicated. Well, yeah, but it, it's mainly for uh, changing audio frequencies and, and whatnot, or, or is it not? So there are two things I look for in a mixer. The big thing is, big thing is obviously phantom power for, mm -hmm. for good mics and preamp. Yep. Which really, you know, that's the initial signal. That then it's the then there's actually the mixing part. Yep. Now the traveler is a, a one you rack device, yep. so it's and firewire controlled. So my mixer is actually on my computer. Oh, cool. But I could do it manually, but the knobs on the device are sucky. I'd rather do it on the machine. So and, and for me, I've got the actual device. Yeah. But I bought a USB one to be able to stream directly into the computer. So which is another piece, right? That that's yeah. a digitizer on top of that. No, it's built in. Yeah, but that's what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, it's but like, yes, yes. You know, th this is what's happened today. Mixers aren't mixers anymore. They're yeah. also preamps, power, yeah. digitizers. Like they're all integrated for for a steal for just a yeah. few hundred dollars. Uh, mine was under two. Right. And, and and the sound quality is great. <clears throat> and I don't like the sound of my own voice when I hear it, unless I bump up the the mid range and the bass slightly. So that's what I like, and, and that's why every time I, I'm at home, he goes, God, you sound good there. Well, it's gonna be ah, I'm using all my equipment. <laughs> well, and you know, the other direction to go in is a road, right? Mm -hmm. A little road podcasting mic is your preamp, your digitizing, everything in the mic. It's but just USB. Thanks for saying that, because I bought the Rode Procaster. Right. But, which go, uh, goes directly into a board, but it's the exact same mic. And I, I, as far as I, uh, I've noticed, it's fantastic because it's very directional. So you have to speak directly into the mic, but it catches no other ambient noise in the room. Fans, choppers going overhead, the dog whimpering at the door, nothing, which is awesome. And that, that makes a huge difference. Sure. Which mic do you use? I use an AT-1010. Uh, okay, so Audio-Technica. Basic Audio-Technica, but it is a broadcast mic. And the you know the reason you get such a rich sound out of this is the large diaphragm mic. I mean, most of what you've got up here are large diaphragm mics, except for the twenty one hundred. Yeah. Speaking of microphones, uh, I use an ATR twenty one hundred, the one that you see on the left. Yeah. So sixty dollars. And, and that's the one I travel with. Then you so, have uh, the Yeti from Blue for one twenty, which is a really good microphone, especially for sitting on a table if you're doing an in person, you know, across the table. Have it standing straight up, it'll pick up their voice, your voice, with no problem. And, and again, that's the one that if you set it in your room and you have a fan going, you're going to hear the fan. Whereas with the uh, with the podcaster, yeah. if it's angled towards you and it's not like right next to you, you probably won't pick up the fan. It's a lot more relaxed. Nice. And, and, and we can talk about ambient noise and all that stuff in a little bit because I know you've got a story about water cooling and certain other things oh, yeah. that you've had to do. But yeah, So the road podcaster... And then the Coupe de Gras, the high LPR 40 for 327. I mean, it's, that's for a If you want to spend money on microphone, you can go get yourself a blue for four grand. Yeah. Right? Well, like, because as much as they, they will take your money. Oh, yes, they will. <laughs> and what's the difference between a $4,000 microphone and a $1,000 microphone? Three grand. Bingo. <laughs> uh, some other recommended equipment there's the Zoom H4N. Uh, there on the bottom, you might be able to see the, the bump outs. Uh, you can plug in XLR cables, so you're running like not USB. You can plug in your XLR. Look at that. Right. There's one right there, live in person. Uh, headphones, like I mentioned, uh, boom arm to keep the microphone in a specific position in front of you, and you don't have to worry about bumping it or anything like that. Or you know, you like to tap on the counter or something, which I do periodically. Or, or type. Yes, or yeah. type during yeah. a show. Um, webcam. Uh, one of the most popular and best that you can buy, in my opinion, is the Logitech C920. $68, 1080p, full HD. Yeah. Beautiful, and it's it's great. And yeah, that, that's actually the webcam that both of us use. I think JJ has one, doesn't he? No, Does he he's, have got, one? he's got the step down. Okay. But, the, but that, that one is fantastic, and I believe that's the actual Amazon price for it. Yes. Target sells this and will match that price, if you ask them. Many local stores will, mm -hmm. like Micro Center, if you've got one in your neighborhood, they've, they've actually matched the price for the uh, ATR2100 microphone. And I can tell you that the uh, mic, uh, the mic boom, it, it's a must for anybody doing this more than once a month or once a year. I mean, I, I couldn't live without mine. I really couldn't. Without the, the mic boom. The, the oh. microphone arm. The arm there. I mean, that that's just... It, it's, it's a necessity, and, and, and they're not cheap. So uh, I got my kit, I think you had 239 there, right? For the, uh, for the podcaster. 
Uh, yes. Yep. 229. For three hundred dollars, I got the boom, that a pop filter, um, the, uh, the the connector, which is the uh, floating what's uh, anti-vibration filter anyway, um, and like fifteen feet of XLR cord for three hundred bucks. So that's a good price. Yeah. Nice. That's why I bought it. Yeah. Bundles are always good if you can find them on Amazon or any other company that does AV equipment. Mm -hmm. DH video, they do they do a lot of good bundles as well. Uh, here, here's some right. mixers, the Behringer XEN YX502, $45. Yep. Uh, the Q802 USB for $80. And then the you know, 1204 USB for $180. Yep. Uh, now, now, just to talk, uh, talk about these really quick, because I actually have experience with two of these that are up here. The Behringer is the one that I run. On the right, the Xenix for about 180. I had the Behringer uh, Q802. It had so much hiss out of the box that recording my voice, I could barely hear it, and I couldn't get rid of it. And that was if you you need to read reviews on these because the price you get what you pay for. Uh, that one got sent back immediately, and uh, as, as I was doing reviews for the second one because I bought it on price at first. Um, then I started reading reviews because I'm an idiot. You know, I don't read the manual first. This does not work. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, all the reviews said that every single model had hiss problems and noise problems. So when I moved up to the to the uh, 12, uh, 1204 USB, all of that went away, and it's plug and play on any device that I've had. I've never had to load a driver. It's including the Mac, which surprised me because I figured you'd have have to load a driver on the Mac. Nothing. Just plug it in and go. Uh, then, you know, if you're doing a video, uh, you've got Skype or Google Plus, the Hangouts, as I mentioned before. Um, I like Google Plus Hangouts because, you know, if you do the on-air function, it automatically ties right into your YouTube channel. So you've got, you know, video, you've got audio. You can download the video, extract the audio with some software that I'll talk about in a few moments. Skype will give you the best overall video and audio quality, I believe. Uh, but you have to have a third-party software program to record your shows. Uh, as we mentioned before, you can use Audacity and you can route things and do some stuff a little bit, a little bit more trickery to get going. But it does, it does work well once you get it going. Uh, but like I mentioned, Google Plus is just super simple, and you've got screen sharing functionality, like I mentioned before, with our Codecast show. You can have live chat going right there, right in that same window for people. Live Q&A, live chat, live IM. Yeah, it's screen sharing, uh, audio calling as we found, or phone calling as we found out the yeah. first on and off. Yeah, not with the on-air functionality, no. but just the standard. Yeah, the standard one. Yeah. But still, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, some software. Uh, again, like I mentioned back in the disclaimers, this is stuff that I personally have used. Um, Free video to MP3 converter, very small thing for PC. It's free, you just gotta make sure to uncheck a few boxes because you don't want a bunch of the junk, the free stuff that they like to throw on there. Um, as we mentioned before with Audacity, uh, if you wanna export your MP3 files, you gotta have the lame encoder plugin. It's all open source, it's free, it's good stuff. And something to tag your files with, you know, your show title, um, album art, stuff like that. Um, I use Tagger for Mac and ID3 Tag Editor for PC, both of them for free. And I use one that I wrote like 10 years ago on VB, VB6 or, or .NET 1 or something. Other useful software, GarageBand on Mac is wonderful if you want to create your own custom intro music and outro. Uh, JJ, our co-host on a couple other shows, he's done some really good stuff and I've had this for about a month and I've played around with it. And some people have been like, oh my god, that is really great. So. Some really good stuff. Uh, Ecamm call recorder for Skype is available for recording Skype calls. That that's thirty dollars. And uh, video call recorder from Skype for if you're using PC, so you can record your videos kind of the same way as uh, the Google Plus Hangouts. We haven't used that in an actual show recording, but we've tested it. And it, it actually does work because uh, we've had one guest, uh, Mary Jo. She's like. Mary Jo Foley, she's like, I'm not, I don't want to set up a Google Plus Hangout, is that okay? Like, that's fine. So we were able to work it where you know, we 
have are still on as well. Yep. Your show's created, your first episode's recorded, now what are you going to do with it? Uh, you, you have to, you know, you're going to make sure you have your album art, because that's the first thing that people are going to see when they're browsing through iTunes or they're browsing other podcast apps and they're doing searches. That's the first thing people are going to see. So if it looks like you know, crap, then you know, people might not want to listen to, their, to your show or give it a chance. But if you got at least got nice album art, they'll likely at least give it a good look. Accumulate, you know, compare that to packaging of products on shelves, you know, in the store. It's nice visual. iTunes wants it to be in PNG or JPEG format, 1400 by 1400 pixels, with a maximum of 2048 by 2048. Now, who will hold your audio files? You have to host them somewhere, or you can actually host them, you know, on your local equipment because people need to be able to download them. Some options, uh, you've got Libsyn at Libsyn.com. Blueberry uh, is another one. SoundCloud as well, and your own personal web host. Well, and, and since everyone in here is, is probably a developer, or most likely in the development realm, there's also Azure, there's OneDrive, there's uh, Google Files if you can get a link. I mean, there's lots of places. Or, or if you have the bandwidth that this guy over here has, you know, um, that, that you need. You have to go to the cloud. There's no other way. No other way. Yeah. And, and there are multiple different ways that you can host that. I mean, there just is. Some cost, some don't. Well, most cost. Right. Uh, like I said, Libsyn is, uh, we use that for our four main shows. I'm getting ready to try Blueberry with another show that I'm launching. Uh, hosting plans start at five a month for 50 meg of file uploads, which typically with our if our show goes about an hour, we have about 25 to 27 megabyte files to upload when we export and we do them in 64 kilobit per second quality. Um, you know, you can... For with, audio, it's not going to make a difference to go up any higher, really, no. except for size. Right. I mean, what, what do you record in 64 or are you in 128? 96. 96? Yeah. So just slightly, yeah. Just okay. a slight bump above. There's just no reason, right? Plus, you're... To make clear audio, you're going to compress it anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, they did, we did this on show 1100. We talked a lot about how we the actual process we go through, but um, we know that most of our listeners are listening on their commute, right, mm -hmm. while they're moving around. Right. And so you don't have not only you don't have their eyes, you know, and only have their ears. You don't even have 100 percent of their attention, hopefully, right. so they don't die. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so. so the show is deliberately compressed. We take all of some of the highs and the lows out and tighten it up and then make the middle section brighter. So it's really easy to hear. So it's, e you know, that's very deliberate. We're making it for that loud condition uh, that you're operating in. Uh, and the same goes for, we do a lot of noise subtraction and things. We use Audition. Yeah. Uh, but because it's plugins allow us to take a lot of background noise out and do a lot of that EQ effect digitally. Yeah, and easily. And quickly. You don't have, you know, we have audio engineers that work on our shows and they could do the manual passes through EQs and so forth. That's just because we've been doing this a long time. But you don't need to do any of that. Like if you're willing to pay for Audition, those plugins are great and they will clean your sound up a Audition lot. Audition isn't super expensive. 300 bucks. Yeah. And it, or you buy the, the, I think you have to get up with the subscription now, which is $20 a month or something. Oh, that's right. even better, yeah. yeah. But, but $300, depending on how many shows you're doing, is ch dirt cheap, right? For I mean, if something you're gonna, you're gonna one or two, Yeah, if you're gonna do one or two a year and you're committed to two years, it's only a few bucks an episode. Plus it's, multi, you know, the multi-tracking part of this is an important mm -hmm. part. You know, the advantage when you have somebody on Skype rather than in person, You've recorded them in complete isolation, so you can fix a lot of stuff if right. you want to. You know, the, the big and these are subtle things people don't notice right away on podcasts. But on Donet Rocks, nobody steps on anybody, right? Right. So if you start answering before I finished asking the question, which happens all the time in real life because we're recording in isolation, we'll just push that apart. So it it sounds completely smooth, but it's it's better than real life, mm -hmm. which is even better. That's the goal. It's, I try to make it as easy as possible for people to understand what we're talking about. Right. Yeah. yeah, whereas on video, it's kind of hard. Very to hard to do. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. And that is yeah. one, of the, one of the downsides of using Google Plus Hangouts. So. Yeah, it's only one channel. So. Right. But, uh, so, uh, so you do everything off of Skype then? 
Yes, but you know, my solution to Skype is I have a separate computer for Skype that's feeding into my board, right? So gotcha. I don't need soft, it's just a channel for Mike and a channel for, for, for So they both come in and you get you They get come in on separate signals, them. they're completely isolated and I can do my own mix back, mm -hmm. right? Perfect. And now I also have a Telos because I've been doing this that long <laughs> that captures normal phone lines. And back when Skype first came out, you couldn't go to phone lines with it. Yes. And so I still have that device with two manual phone lines. But now the challenge is, can I have somebody on a phone line, somebody on Skype, and me, and we can all hear each other and still record in isolation? Yeah, back in the episode 100s days, yeah. you know, I remember somebody calling in and hearing it. It was off at one point. But that was early on. Yeah. Well, you and know. Skype is great until it isn't. Yes. Right? Because when Skype unravels, it's catastrophic. Oh, yeah. Yes. And so the, and there's a few things we do for every Skype caller. One is turn off automatic game. Because mm -hmm. automatic game doesn't help the user, it helps Skype. It allows yes. Skype to do more compression by turning down the volume and suppressing a bunch of noise. And then when the guy starts stopping again, his volume is much higher and then it catches up. It just makes our crappy recording. Yep. So get him to shut off automatic game. And so you didn't, I, I, having never used the Mac version of Skype, I know how to turn off automatic game in Skype on the Mac. Because <laughs> we do it so often. Right. That, that's, that's funny, but it's a good tip. Yeah. And I, I don't think Google Plus Hangouts has that no, capability. I, mean, I, I, I haven't seen gain in there, which yeah. kind of sucks. As the producer, but it still works. you've got producer mode. I mean, I can raise a person's volume or kind of pipe them down if somebody is really loud to try to even try and smooth that out right try to do that in time. That's, but that's the only controls you have within that and that's a very much a live model right yes I mean, and we're we're very much a post-production model. right and we have the folks to do that I mean, you know yeah. we well, don't edit our own shows we have people that's their job we've got people for that right? yeah well <laughs> the way they're good. way better at it. real audio oh, yeah. engineers are so much better at it than we could ever hope to be they're faster Maybe they've got better ears for it, and it makes, a, it makes a world of difference. And they love the job. Regular audio engineering jobs could suck compared to editing audio and podcasts because they can do whatever they want, right? I have a published schedule of when we're going to put out the shows. They need to edit it before it needs to go up. They do it when they want to. They're very happy. But, you know, again, the advantage of doing this for 13 years is it's a business. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You've built up your nice network of people. You've got your process down. And Helps take a little bit of ease of mind off you guys so you can focus on great content. When I think it's a big part of what you, what do you want from podcasting? You know, making podcasting into a job for a lot of folks would ruin it. Mm -hmm. It's not as much. I have to make three shows a week, guys. Really four, because I do, yeah, you I do, do your as own well. Yeah, yeah. I have panic attacks every so often. Like, how am I going to come up with another block of shows? Because I have advertisers who I've committed to. Right. Yeah. They're expecting their. They, they, they don't care how I was feeling, whether or not I made a show or not. They right. make a show. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Lipson also, you can get a lot of statistics, so you can find out, you know, who's listening from where in the world, how they're consuming your content, whether they're downloading it, even by browser, uh, by device, etc., like that. So it's really good things. We we have never had any issues with Lipson as our host. Blueberry, like I said, I'm going to be using this pretty soon, but their plans start at 12 per month. 100 mega file uploads, uh, stat analytics are included with that as well. If you're using WordPress for uh, your website, uh, it integrates really well with the PowerPress plugin. SoundCloud, for six a month, you can upload up to six hours of content. They have a, a premium plan uh, there at the bottom for 15 a month that allows you unlimited episodes or uploads. It's so actually not too bad either. No, price-wise, that's not too bad. Yeah, I think most people in here could do their podcast for six bucks a month. Yes. There. That's not bad at all. Um, get your RSS feed verified. That link there, castfeedvalidator.com. Very important. Once you have your files uploaded, um, run it through that validator right there, and it'll pop up with some errors, because if there's errors in it, uh, you will not be able uh, iTunes will sometimes kick your show back, and that can also be for... Uh, Something I'll mention here in a moment as well with the hyperlinks in your first episode, they'll give an error and that could cause your show to not be found in podcast searches. Do you have a question? Yeah, um, going back to the other the posters. Uh, do you have any issues with who owns the intellectual property? I, that's probably some wild left field question, but I just wonder. I mean, okay, so LinkedIn, 
LinkedIn and some of the social media sites have the deal. If you post, they used to. If you post your content, we own the IP. And I was just wondering if some of these hosting places, in your world, do you ever run into that? Uh, I have. Where you were maybe in some small print, you agreed to give up the intellectual property for what you're posting. Not that I, you, I, I doubt it. I'm just asking. Yeah, that's. Yeah. I, I don't think SoundCloud d does because a lot of musicians post there. Yeah. Um, but but they're posting it public, right? Yeah. I know. So so technically, one of the things is is you're posting this, people can get to it. I right? understand. And, and you can't say piracy. But I haven't seen anything like that. But that's one of the other reasons why one of my comments were use Azure, use your own hosting site, create a link, and, and contain it yourself, right? Yeah, then you wouldn't have to worry about that. Because I haven't seen that fine print in Azure yet. Google Plus probably, or Google probably has it somewhere. That's very fun. Yeah. Um, how do people find your shows? You know, once you've got everything out there and you've shared your RSS feed with the different, some of the different directories that link there, Podcast 411. It's not perfectly up to date, but there's a good starting point there. You want to make sure you're on Stitcher, iTunes, TuneIn Radio. Those are like you know, some of the big three. Once it gets iTunes, and the feed is actually published. Uh, pretty much any podcasting app will find it. Uh, one biggest issue is like with Windows Phone podcast app, since they use Bing search, it takes a little while to get into their system. It's got to, you've got to do some hoops you've got to jump through, which I'll talk about in an upcoming slide as well. So like I mentioned, iTunes, uh, that link there, which I'll, I'll make this entire presentation available for download. I'll have a nice OneDrive short link up here if you guys want to be able to download if the slides. It today. Yes. If it works. Yeah, yesterday OneDrive was broken on the short link. So. And uh, like I mentioned, uh, one of the errors is a byte range request error when you're submitting to iTunes. And that's because you know the first episode will have a clickable link in it. So it'll throw up an error. And if you go to that Lipson link there at the bottom, that'll detail everything you got to do to take care of that issue. <clears throat> Stitcher radios, as, as I mentioned, more and more auto manufacturers with their new car head units, you know, like with XM, you know, they're now integrating Stitcher radio into that. So people can find your shows that way. So if you subscribe on Stitcher and you've got your account logged in on your, in your car, you know, you can find your favorite shows right there and listen to them while you're driving around. If you don't want to, you know, connect your phone into your, in your car. Talk about the next boost and, and you know, uh, I guess. podcast audio or or any show audio for that matter, streaming audio. So tune in, yeah. Tune in radio, like I mentioned, very similar to Stitcher. It's available on your mobile apps and all your devices. You can find that. So to submit your feed there, you have to email them just with some certain information. Usually they're pretty good. Within a couple of days, you'll have confirmation that it's been accepted. And, you know, it'll be published within 24, 48 hours of getting that email. And uh, like I mentioned, Windows Phone and Bing, these are the steps that you used to be able to just email it in when Rob Greenlee was in charge of the podcast division with Microsoft, but he's now with a company called Podcast One, which is a big podcasting network. Uh, but now if you s try to submit it via email, this you get this exact information that's here. That's, that's in their email response that they don't do the email submission anymore. You've got to jump through those hoops so it shows up on Windows Phone and those services. Can you make money in podcasting? Yes, you can. <laughs> yeah, But is it easy? No, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> I mean, there's all sorts of different ways that you can make money. Sponsors, advertisers, mm -hmm. sell shirts, stickers, just partnerships, yes. clicks, links, exactly, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, like right now, I mean, I do kind of do this full time on a on a full time basis. <coughs> am I making a killing? No. But am I making enough to where I'm making more than we're putting out? Yes. That's good. That's always good. That's always good. Thankfully, my wife works. Uh, that helps. It always helps. Ways to make money: uh, advertisers, affiliate marketing, uh, Lynda.com, Audible.com is good. Um, Amazon, depending on what state you live in, Missouri, no. Colorado, I think, does not allow also. 
uh, Amazon affiliate marketing. Why, why is that? I, tax what, reasons. What's that? Taxes. Well, well I mean, help, I mean, explain. Tax, I get, I, tax, uh, well, what? whenever I first started podcasting and created my first Amazon affiliate, you know, I got into their little program and it was fine for like two months. And then I got an email saying you know, Missouri was losing that that access. And uh, it's just some kind of regulations between the state and Amazon, and states and Amazon. So it's just That's wonderful. Little, yeah, I mean, it's like, for example, certain states when you buy something on Amazon, you, you have to pay sales, sales tax. Right. But not every state does. Missouri, I don't pay sales tax on Amazon. Yeah, in Minnesota, you do. you do. Yeah. So, but I'm trying, no. to figure, trying to figure out why, why, why you would get a little commission for helping them solve things because you live in. I, I know. Sense. It, it, you're it's right. probably too much trouble for them. Oh, because, oh, not, because not of the worth, tax. It got worth the tax. Not worth their effort to, to the make the money from it. Yeah. I see. They probably have to pay some income tax or something. So yeah. I mean, yeah. like, that's not as fun. Like Lynda.com or Audible. You know, you might you might hear somebody in a show say, you know, go to audible.com forward slash twit, and you know that's you know, it's like a coupon code to get you know certain percentages off of subscription service and things like that or a free 30-day trial something like that and it's a way for that sponsor to let them you know find out well who's actually you know sending traffic our way to get customers signed up for their services so the uh, same thing with radio shows if any of you actually listen to the radio anymore radio shows you'll hear that same thing yeah and that's the same it's thing just with affiliate their, marketing uh, patreon or paypal subscription services so Essentially, donations. I mean, crowdfunding. Uh, Patreon. Uh, Tom Merritt with the Daily Tech News Show. He does the Daily Tech Show as well. And I want to say it's like it's between six thousand and eight thousand dollars a month. People, you know, whether they're just donating it, signing up for a dollar or five dollars or twenty a month, and it's kind of like with Kickstarter. You know, if somebody gives you a dollar, you know, just I'll donate a dollar. It's something you might not give them anything, but you'll you know thank everybody on our Kickstarter campaign. Twenty dollars, you know, maybe send them a shirt or something. If they've been subscribing a while. Just different levels, different rewards you can do. T-shirts are the uh, and coffee mugs. I know I know Richard will agree with coffee mugs, but yeah, I mean we do the, the mug thing and so forth. We make no money on that at all. We no. give away for cost. Yeah. The big thing I'd say with the Patreon stuff is that we don't use that. I don't feel like you can do Patreon and advertising. Right. Like if you're gonna make them listen to ads, make them listen to, listen to ads. And this wasn't available, you know, now I'd have to ditch all my advertisers. Believe me, I've considered it. The thing, where I've seen Patreon really work is people wanna be part of your show. Right. So if you're gonna do, you set thresholds that give them insiderness. Right. Right? But maybe it's a mailing list, maybe it's an inside view. It's just, they wanna be a part of the club. So if it's twenty dollars a month, you know, you get access to stuff first, or you know that kind of thing. Or a private hangout, you know, hey, we'll chat for Absolutely. 15, 20 minutes, just private. I, I just signed up on a Patreon a couple of weeks ago, where for twenty dollars you get invited to the hangout, but you can just text your messages. For a hundred dollars a month, you get to be in the hangout. So That's that, pretty cool. Yeah, and I'm not, I don't care myself, but I, I want to give money because I fucking like their product. I mean, it's great. Uh, if I was going to, honestly, if I was starting from scratch today, I'd look at that really seriously. Because it's, it's, it's mutually beneficial, right? This is very direct feedback for the people most dedicated to your show. Yep. And uh, I was going to say that there, this has been done for a little while. And if anyone in here knows Coast to Coast AM, they do that too. Where George Nori. Yeah, George Nori. Well, it was George uh, Yeah, was it, Art Bell. anyway. Yeah, Art Bell, now it's George Nori and, and a few others. But, they charge a subscription cost to hold their podcast feed, okay? And so it's very minimal. I think it's like 30, 30 bucks every three months. So it's like 10 bucks a month or something like that. But with that, you also get invited to calls to speak with it as well, which I've never done. But I mean, it is cool to have that that sense of, you know, yeah, it's all connection. About, yeah, community, building a community with it. Like we have one listener of Tech Informist. He's really only been listening for, like, probably not even a month now. And as soon as I threw up the uh, PayPal subscription thing on our website, boom, $20 point. Okay. Thank you, sucker. 
I mean, it's and it's awesome. We've really been having a great time, and he joins us every episode in our live chat that we have during the show. He's just really, really a, a great listener, and not not just because he pays, but he's just really involved with what we're doing and nice communication and stuff like that. So it's really great to interact with the listeners as well. Yeah, and that's what what you want is you want right. feedback. Because that makes I mean, it that's even the biggest more thing. Because even if you have a thousand or five hundred thousand downloads a month, if you hear crickets. Other than the downloads, you wonder if anybody's actually I'm listening. Totally to it. with you because you know in the end this is RSS feed. It's automated. Yeah. People, you know, mo for most people, just download automatically. For me, Turn the, on your iPhone, I mean, the variability is the most interesting part. You know, I, I used to be in the early days, it was all RSS feed. Yep. We had the same downloads for every show every time. There was very little variation. In later years, it's fifty percent plus minus. Really? Like half of our downloaders look like RSS feed, and the other half are people just coming and getting. Do shows. One part is we make so many shows, lots of people can't listen to them all. But another part is that people are approaching it differently now. Like mm -hmm. Podcasting is a different relationship with its listener to that. It, it totally is. Yeah, and so you know, some ways you know, if you want to kind of be a serious podcaster, um, look in look on Meetup.com and see if there's Meetup groups related to podcasting in your area. Just doing a quick search in our area, I've actually found like two or three different podcast groups that I'm uh, part of. Uh, there's, you know, look on Facebook and Google Plus for some podcast you know, focus groups and, and, you know, join those communities as well because you'll be meeting other like-minded people trying to either grow their podcast or they want to talk about their podcast. And then there's some podcast conferences, New Media Expo coming up next month in Las Vegas, which will probably have between 70 to 80,000 people coming in. And it's not just podcasts, but it's also kind of all sorts of different media. Um, I'm going to actually be going there. And then podcast movement in Fort Worth, Texas. This is its second year, and it was actually started on Kickstarter. That's how the whole conference came about. That's July 31st to August 2nd, 2015. And then just find other shows that you like and study them for ways to become a better podcaster. I mean, you'll find, you know, you might be like, well, I really like the way that I'm doing my intro, but you know, I listen to this show and I really like their flow and you know the way that they do. You know, they've got their show laid out. That's just a few different ways to kind of help make your show even better. And if anybody has any more questions, uh, we actually got through the slides in, in time. Go ahead. Ask away. Not going. Not going. No, that's fine. Okay, so throughout this, throughout this presentation, you've used the word podcast. Okay, so get into the esoterica, the, the purism. You know, I can find things. YouTube versus podcast. Uh, you've used Goose Google, this, blah, blah, blah. I mean, what, I mean, is it, is it, is it agnostic to the Apple product? Or, I mean, no. it's not an Apple thing anymore. No. I mean, no, it's or just, is it an Apple thing? Or, I mean, I can, so, down, I can download Stitcher on my Note 4, I think. I can yep. put the yep. iTunes yep. on my Note 4. Yep. I can put, so I don't know. What, is there something special about the Apple? Anymore. Nope. I mean, in fact, one of my favorite podcasting apps is available on both iOS and Android, and it's called Pocket Casts, and it's like a four-dollar app. But it's beautiful, and the developers, the creator, I think they're out of Australia. They have such a great sense of humor when they release updates. Their change logs are just hilarious. They have such great personality with that, and they're really, really a, it's a great, solid app. Um, I mean, if you're ever going to spend any money on a, a podcast app, I Highly recommend that for iOS and Android. Gus, I guess right. Yep. I looked at your your site here. I can't. Podcast. Yeah, it's some. Yeah, it's. Uh, Podcast STL. Or STL, yeah. Okay. And I mean, by the way, STL Tech Top. I was very handsome. I mean, very great looking site. I noticed it was it was multi-channel. You know, yes. Facebook, YouTube, blah blah blah. Yeah. You know, I did, so you you guys are going. You're you're making that an obviously to go. I'll call it multi-channel. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. Just. Yeah. I mean. Let's run it. Studios. iPods and right. essentially, I mean, like we mentioned in the history, that's where the term podcast came from. So, yeah, iTunes and Apple had a huge role in, in the explosion of the, the whole genre. So, but JPEG, but I do like it. It's, it's really good. Anybody else? One of the programs I like to use is for a have questions. Sound nation. And it's a web based. They've got to make sure you add in treatments, you add the timeline and stuff like that. And it's all created, they created common zero stuff, so it all becomes your question. 
Oh, nice. Yeah, that's nice. I haven't heard of that one. Do you guys ever do like transcripts of your podcast and throw it up on like a blog to try to reach a different audience? Uh, one of the slides where I had all the uh, had all the shows listed. Um, I had the actual links, and actually, let me see if that's. I mean, I've got links to each show. Let me see if that's on the online version. But it's uh, <clears throat> each show has its own website. So if you just go to techinformist.com, for example, or you go to uh, stltechtalk.com, podcaststl.com, msmobileshow.com, you'll find it has its own website. For sure. Of course, everything's going slow. Uh, that's what the internet's going to work for you today. Right. This, yeah. the, 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 this is a geek conference. Everyone has laptops. Right. Good luck. What What are your thoughts on, uh, uh, you know, providing uh, app for your uh, for your podcast? If you can develop your own app and where it's not going to really cost you a whole lot, I definitely recommend that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we have a we have an app for uh, Windows Phone. So there is one actually out there. Yeah. For stltechhelp.com, I'm not sure. Don Rock just one of the. You know, I think like with that, they got the app there and stuff. I can mm -hmm. log into it, and it's on my my uh, Windows, you know, mm -hmm. machine too and everything. But it remembers what I've watched and where I've been at. Mm -hmm. so, so each of these websites does have its own. You know, you can listen or you can watch it right there on the website. Um, and in fact, each one of those has a just do a forward slash live, and you you'll see our schedule of when we're going to record. Will we try to do a community? kind of thing, a live chat during each recording as well. So you'll see the upcoming schedule, who we might have coming on as guests, and upcoming schedules as well. Mm -hmm. We like guests. Yeah, guests are good. So you're recording this today. Where would I go with um, the Let me go back to the... Yeah, I'll probably have this video up on our one of our YouTube channels. Yeah, I got the audio up really good. So, this is where you can go to actually get this presentation. Um, and if you want, just reach out to me. Uh, connect with me on Twitter. If you're not on Twitter, you can um, email me as well. If you want to write this down, Kevin at stltechdoc.com. Or, I mean, I'm, I'm here all weekend, so if you just want to come up and you know, say hi and stuff like that or ask any more questions, Feel free to. If you're writing out that link, it's probably case sensitive. Yeah, the, the link is case yeah. sensitive, by the way. Yes. I can guarantee that. Um, common short. Right. And, and like I said, as of yesterday, the little short move links were broken. Nice. They were not putting colons when it would when it would pop up the full link. I don't know why. But that's probably that's probably fixed today, I would hope. So Thanks everyone for attending. Yeah, if there's, I mean, I don't know, I wasn't given feedback forms, so if anybody has any feedback or... You can do it on the uh, on the site. Yeah, okay. it's on the site. The site for yeah. the conference. But really appreciate, because this, honestly, this was my first, like, main presentation, so I didn't want to throw that out at the beginning. So, better, hopefully everybody enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. And I'll turn it over to the .NET Rocks guys.